thanks very much for joining us today uh, for another episode of our best practices webinars. And today we're going to be focusing on resource utilization. Uh, I'm Adam, I'll be your host today. So I look after the implementation here at Excel. And John will be presenting the content of today's uh, presentation. And he looks after our service operations design. So today we're going to be going through resource utilization. And we're going to be looking at a few things. Uh, firstly, finding the right people at the right time for a new project. So looking at things like skills. So we've got the right people working on the right tasks. Uh, what to do when things change in a project and how you can use Excello to adjust things. We'll be looking at team scheduling. And then finally looking at some of the uh, dashboards that we can use for time tracking and utilization. As always, we'll leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, so please submit them through out the presentation in either the chat or the Q&A window. Um, but now I'll hand over to John to run us through it. Thanks, Adam. So today we'll be looking at the, the two ways to, to think about how busy my team is. And, and one is the past, looking at performance, how billable my team was versus how non-billable, basically how used my team is. And then also the skills, looking at the actual supply of my team versus actually how much is demanded on them. And what this sort of information does is it helps us look at hiring, whether I bring on contractors, those sort of things. The other side of it is future, how my current projects are projecting out, how busy the team is, and also the planned projects that are coming through the pipeline, how that's going to affect how busy my team is. And then lastly, the again, the skill side. If I have just assigned or brought on a lot of work with very specialized skill sets, do I have the resources to be able to put on those projects and help my clients? Or is that something where I need to, again, hire um, individuals to, to help me fulfill on those promises? So what we're first looking at is a example project. In this case, we'll look at a, a new website project. And first, we'll look at how to set up a project template with the skills and the different approaches to assigning out work. And then we'll look at the, the different users and how to set up the skills within the groups and um, their availability to be able to even see who the right person is with the right skills. And then we'll have a live project come in um, and have a, a timeline for who to sign out to. So first, let's start with a project template. This is through the configuration area on the back end of Excello. And within projects, we'll have project templates. In this account, there's just two, but in your account, you may have more project templates. And what we found a lot of customers of ours really getting a value out of these templates, besides putting in a timelines and, and hour estimates, those have helped on team scheduling as well, but also taking it one step further and putting skills on the, the tasks and the work that needs to be assigned out. So for example, here, I see that I need to code the HTML of the, the website for it to eventually go live. So if I go into this task, you'll see that there's a skill set area. And what I can do is I can either select from a preset skills that I've already used within the system, or I can even add skills at this point. So in this case, I really need someone who has HTML experience, which is already here in the system. But if I wanted to take it one step further, maybe I need someone who has HTML5, or who has JavaScript experience, not just the, the HTML on the website, I can put in Angular or Node, for example. And I can add new skills on the fly. The, the other part of templates that have, have really helped out is being able to look at the task base versus the resource base approach. So most of the templates, and if you're still trialing our software, you'll find that they're task based, which means this is what I need to do. I need to mock up the design. I need to wireframe the design and get client approval. Some other approaches that we've seen if you're taking a purely task-based approach is to do resources. So instead of saying mock-ups and wireframe, we might put uh, design resource number one and design resource number two. 
and treat these not as tasks, but as the people who need to work on it. And then we have our weekly standups and they manage their tasks or even break out these different phases into more tasks. So those are the two different approaches that we're seeing. The, um, the resource approach where we put the, the person who needs to be put in or the task-based approach like coding the HTML. So now that we have the HTML task on the, the website template, what we need to make sure is that we have people on our team who have HTML skills. But first, what we can do is we can set up the, the people who already have uh, HTML skills or who we know. So for example, if I were to come in here, go into the, the users, if I'm setting up a user, I'll always get prompted to add a skill, but if I'm coming in and editing, you can see that James has both UX and Angular skills, but I'm gonna add a HTML to his. And because I've already added it as a task, it's showing up here in the list. So whether I'm adding it on the fly here, or I'm adding on the fly from the task, or even from live projects, it's a shared task base, um, or is this shared uh, skill-based system, so you can essentially access it anywhere that you want. And the last place to manage the skills would be through the skills area here. So I can add a skill at any time, I can come in here, edit, or even delete skill sets. So that's everything on the skill side to find the, the right person with the skills. The other part is uh, finding the, the right person based on their availability. So availability in Excello is defined on a per person basis. So if I come into here under preferences, this is where John, in this case, myself, I'm able to not only set up my work week, but also any vacations or, or time off. So in this case, I'm working every day a week, but let's say that I wanted to take Fridays off and have a very light Thursday. What will happen is when I start getting assigned out tasks, if someone tries to assign it to my Friday, I'll start getting warnings. Um, and also the tasks will spread over my allocated time and we'll see what that looks like on the team schedule. And then secondly, I can put together a vacation for myself. So let's say that I, I wanted to take off then next week, maybe I'm going uh, camping. Again, what will happen is a warning on assigning task or a, a spread of time to after I'm camping, for example. So now that we have that project and all the, the users set up, what we'll do is we'll create a, a live project and we'll show how to start scheduling out that work. Now, if you're familiar with putting together quotes on the sales side, just keep in mind, I am skipping over that section just for the, the call today, but oftentimes you might have a, a live project come directly from a, a sale or from a quote that I put together. So let's say Nike is getting more into um, skiing products. So it's a new uh, skiing website for a new type of ski, for example. What we found the best status if you're looking to plan or, or scope out projects is to have initial stage called planning. And what this will do is it will help us as we're doing um, reviews of the entire project pipeline is to see which ones are active and which ones still need to be resourced or are planned out. So here I'll drop in that project template. If you remember on the 
code HTML, I have two skill sets that are already put there. And I'm going to leave everything unassigned. And the reason I'm doing that is so that I can see how busy each of my team members are before I assign out tasks to them. From this point, there's two ways to get to team scheduling. One would be through the top navigation. Anywhere in the system, you're able to get to team scheduling. In this workflow, though, if I have just created a project, what we found is project managers or resource managers like just going straight to schedule work. And the value of that is it's going to already pull up the project plan that I'm currently in on the left-hand side. It just makes it easier for scheduling out work rather ha than having to look up the skiing website when I come to the team schedule. So now what we can see here on the left-hand side are all the tasks or uh, resources that are needed. And on the right-hand side, we have how busy everyone is. Usually when we're scheduling out in the beginning of a project, since we're looking at weeks or, or even longer, we found the, the team likes to go to the week view. And then taking it one step further, I need someone who has a HTML skill set. So I'll just filter by who has HTML. And it's pulling up the three people on the team who have an HTML skill who are basically able to code out at least the, um, the structure of the website. So what we'll see here on the dropdown is the three tasks or the three skills that we saw in James' profile as well as if I were to look down, it looks like John has a bit more skills and then Jason has a few other, but they all share that HTML skill set, and that's why they're showing up on the right-hand side. So let's see, in this case, it's from May 16th to May 30th this week. It looks like James and John currently have work on their plate, but Jason looks fairly free. So all I have to do is drag and drop this task from the left-hand side onto Jason's calendar. And we'll talk about the differences of commit, schedule, assign, and split a little bit later on. But right now, all I wanna do is assign the task. And what this will do is it will assign a task on JSON from May 16th to May 30th. So it doesn't actually matter where I drag it onto his calendar, at least in this case when I'm assigning out the task, it's just automatically going back to that original project plan and the due dates that I outlined in there. So even if I drag it here, if you see that I sign it, it goes to the original plan dates of uh, May 16th in this week. So that's how you set up the, the project, set up the users, and find the right person to, to work on it. And, and that's really good for the beginning of the project to get everything on, on everyone's plate. Now what usually happens on projects is they don't go exactly as planned, and that's where the changing project schedule is really important to look at from a team scheduling or utilization perspective. So the first one is what happens when the, the start dates shift or the project starts shifting around. So in this case, we saw that Jason is coding the HTML um, starting May 16th. But let's say if we went back to the, the website, maybe the website's pushing back or the initial stages of the design have pushed back. And they can be pushed back in two ways. One would be just not starting any of the kickoff or any of the design. We can have those automatically push these dates back on the start. So that's already built into the system. I can't show that on a, a live call though. So what we will do within the, the edit plan, I'll just show you the manual way, the pushback. And this might be like, after I had a client call, um, they said, you know what, we need to push this off a, a week or so. And we manually push back our internal kickoff because there's no sense in, in starting it uh, too far in advance before actually starting the project. So if you take a look here, I've pushed back that internal kickoff call. And because we've put dependencies within our projects, it's now pushed back the design phase which has pushed back the development phase, which if you take a look, the coding, the HTML, it has now automatically shifted back to May 24th. So 
now what happens if we were to come back to the team schedule is the project has shifted back and because the team schedule is so tightly integrated with the, the project plan itself, I don't have to do anything as a project manager. If you take a look at Jason's calendar, he's now completely free on May 15th without anyone having to readjust his time on a spreadsheet or anything like that. And now it's automatically pushed back to the next week where we can see it's now starting on the 24th with coding HTML. So those are one of the ways that plans get shifted or changed and how it automatically updates my team's utilization. Uh, another way would be if Jason comes into this task, whether he's pulling it from his task for timesheet or, or from this view and says, you know what, John, I know you said that this is a 50 hour task, but I'm taking a look at this and it really feels more like a hundred hour task or maybe 80 hours. So what's now happening is as I update the, the 80 hours spread over a few weeks, is it went from five hours of him working on it a day to now eight hours of it working on a day. The, the way our team scheduling works is it takes the entire hours of a task and spreads it evenly across every single day of the week over the duration of the task. So it's essentially doing the calculation automatically for us, and now it's showing as, as eight hours that he needs to work on a day, which means that it looks like he's getting a little bit overloaded in these first few days. And then the, the last part is when scope changes. And there's two approaches to when scope changes. If it's an internal scope, you might do exactly what I did, automatically change it. If it's a client asking to change the SOAP, what we found best practices is to go back into the edit project plan and to, on, or, and to update the, the task and the milestones, and then that would automatically reflect, uh, reflect on the team schedule. So shifting uh, out of the digital web space into more of the IT consulting MSP space, what we wanted to share with some best practices around scheduling out specific time, like ticket time, the best time to remote in, or training time when I'm going to go on site at the, the client. So in this case, let's say that all the, the testing for this, or maybe we just rename this to uh, training. So what we can do with the training is a few things. We can take a similar approach where I drag and drop the, the task if there's just one trainer that needs to work on it. And I can assign the task. So it would show up on his calendar. And so from this point, there's a, a few ways that I can start blocking out time. One would be just drag and drop task like this onto his calendar. And usually I would want to go to the, the day view. So let's say in, in this case, instead of having two hours and 30 minutes of that auto spread, we want to block off the entire day. And there's two approaches to this. One would be committing time saying, Raj, I want you to work eight hours on this today and I don't care. And that would be more of that remote in, I, I just want you to remote in to the client sometime today. Whereas scheduling time would be more like, I want you to show up on site at 9 a.m. So if I were to look at commit time, it's just a hour assignment, no time of the day. And then if I were to look at Friday, if I actually scheduled the time, here I'm able to put actually the, the hours that I, I wanna block off. 
And you'll start seeing the differences show up in colors as well, where the task auto time is the green, and then the schedule time yellow, committed time blue. The, the other piece of it is scheduling specific uh, ticket time. And this is a, a bit of a limitation within Excello around scheduling ticket time because we can't assign full tickets out on the team schedule to show and block off time. So what we have to do is either put a task coming off of a ticket or, like I said, um, a, a meeting coming off of it. So if I were to resize the logo, pull that over to Diju, what we'll see is a, a task automatically show up and we can say this would be the time to go on site. But again, because it's a task, it's just a hour assignment over a day. And we could go to the schedule time, but if the client is involved in the on-site meeting, like you want to share this on their calendar, we found that putting a meeting on the task or directly against the, the ticket itself has been really helpful. So I wanna pull in Lauren, who's over at American Airlines. We're coming to her office in Fort Worth. Maybe there is a, a gate code for the on-site meeting. And you know what, I, uh, I didn't include any of my internal team on that. So let's, uh, let's put DJ. on the 4th of May. So we'll see these meetings sitting in here. It's pulling out as scheduled time on the tasks underneath the ticket as well. And then we'll start seeing it show up um, over here too. So you can see on DJ's calendar as a specific time of day, and this is an actual meeting that we can send to the client. The, the next part, moving out of team scheduling and booking out things into the future is to see how my team is performing into the past how they're billable versus non-billable and, and how my, my skill sets are stacking up. A lot of this is underpinned on, on really good time tracking for the team. So I'm going to share some, some time tracking best practices and then we can go into looking at the utilization dashboard. So one way to log time, and it's just a quick one from the demo, any, anytime you see a task or a, a ticket sitting around, you can pretty easily come in and log time against it. So there's a hyperlink. Sometimes it would be through adding activity, like taking uh, the time tracking on an email. The, the quickest way just to, to demo and, and usually to log time is just to use the quick log time. The other way to log time, and this comes directly off of the team schedule, is to use the weekly timesheet. And what we'll see on the weekly timesheet is the time that I've already logged, the five hours on the design task. But the weekly timesheet directly correlates to what I'm scheduling or planning out on the team schedule. So for example, I need to do the logins for the mobile app it's taking the total amount of time for the task and dividing it by the number of days on the task. And you can see here that there's a suggestion for me to log the time, which directly correlates to the amount of time coming from the team schedule. So what this does is it makes it really easy for the team to get their time in based on how long we even want them to work. And this is a bit of an awkward suggestion because it's just dividing the total task time over the number of days. So maybe it only took me four hours this day, for example. And 
and it's still suggesting an hour and 15 because that's how much I had originally scoped out for the day. The, the other thing that's automated on these timesheets is meeting time and email time automatically coming in. So what we can see here is the scheduled activity, either it's an on-site meeting or just a block off of time. And here it has the gates to code and the on-site meeting. And all I have to do is say that I've done it. Maybe I wanna put my notes. and save that. So those are all the, the billable activities in the system, but there are a lot of non-billable things that I, I might do. And more often than, than not, I would wanna look them up here in the, the find work area. So this find work, you can find anything. So you can quickly find the, the website that we originally started working on. If I wasn't assigned to it, but I did do work on it, I can quickly pull this up and add time against it. But let's say that I was working on maybe reporting for my project team today. What I can do is pull up an internal shift digital client. So this is the, the best practice for putting together internal work on the team is you would create a client called internal and then you would put an internal project like admin work. And while we aren't covering this today, there are ways to have a completely non-billable project so that any time I log time against it, it's going to show as non-billable on my utilization dashboard. And then lastly, anytime that I'm logging time against a sale or a, a company profile, we're considering that like account management or new business development time, which isn't directly client billable work. So let's say that I'm just checking in with Nike had a hour long call with them on Wednesday. This is also going to show as, as non-billable. I, I don't have the option to mark it as billable. Whereas the design work, if I were to look into the activity, I do have an option to make it billable and non-billable. And by default, I'm billing out for the design on this e-commerce website. So now the, the last step is seeing how my team has performed in the future and then also in the past. So the best way to see that, to find an aggregate of how busy the team should be and how busy they are is through the utilization dashboard. And what I wanna do is start with the, the past. So what I can see here for myself is that I'm, I'm way overutilized. And on the demo today, the design work that I've done is showing as 13 hours of billable or 46% uh, of my time, and then five hours as non-billable. And these percents are derived from the, the 18 hours that I've logged over the 28 hours. So if you remember, I stopped working on Friday and I have a very light day on Thursday from the preferences that I set up. So um, the, the total amount of time available to me is set up by the, the preferences or the vacations that I'm also taking. If I wanna add people, it's really common to either use skill sets, like I wanna see how busy my design or the, the people who know HTML, but more often than not, I wanna group different skill sets and different groups together. So you can use quick filters to be able to set up different conditions. Like I want people who are within a certain group who are managed by certain people on the team. You can start putting together a quick filters to easily come back to. So in this case, it's now pulling up the three people who are in the UX team and I can compare their utilization against each other. So in this case, John is consistently overworked. Maybe he should start working on Fridays. Whereas uh, Jason and James, it looks like they are traditionally underbooked. So that would give me a, a good clue of maybe I'm not bringing in enough work for them. Or there's the other side of the performance where I am bringing in enough work, but they're starting happy hour at 3 p.m. every afternoon. 
The other side of the utilization dashboard is the estimate, or you can think of this as the forecasted time. So auto time was those tasks that automatically um, relate to the project plans. So anytime you assign out a task to a team member, it'll show as purple here. So I can start forecasting into the future how busy the team is. Jason is, is really underbooked. So maybe his skills, he needs to skill up. Maybe we're not bringing in enough work for his specific skill sets. And then it goes up from here on, on how locked in that time is. So if you remember, if we're scheduling on-site visits, that will show up here. If we're committing or blocking out time, it will show up as blue. You can see it here. And because we integrate a two-way sync with Outlook Office 365 Calendar and Google Calendar, we can even pull in external appointments. So these tend to be like team stand-ups, dentist appointments, lunch with my mother. All that factors into how busy you are every day. It might not be uh, directly work-related, but it still can factor into your overall utilization forecast into the future. The, the last part of this is digging into the numbers on the utilization. So behind all these numbers, if I went to the, the previous weeks, I'll be able to see exactly what happens with John and, and why he's so busy here through the details. Uh, another way to get to this would be through the timesheet report here and just searching how busy John was within that given week. So here we can see it's the, the given week on the utilization dashboard just for John. He's been really busy on American Airlines and it looks like he's been doing some uh, in, internal admin reporting. So if you do want to really dig in and see where people are spending their time, if they're efficient, are they spending 20 minutes on an email or 50 minutes on a design that maybe should just be 10 minutes, you can start looking at the, the really small improvables. So this screen tends to be more of a direct manager of, of a team, maybe a project manager giving really good feedback to her team. Whereas the utilization dashboard is more general feedback how busy am I? Are there things that I can do, shift project plans or, or shift workload, bring in new business to keep my team really busy? So you can think of this as more the strategic view of how busy my team is and managing that, those hours. Whereas the timesheet is the more tactical manager point of view, um, still related around time, still affecting the overall utilization, but more on the, the granular uh, level. 